Let's begin our work on Unit D by having a look at uh, the Earth, which is our biosphere. When you actually look at a photograph of Earth taken from outer space, you begin to realize that we are on what is referred to as a closed system here. That everything that we need on Earth is already located within the Earth, and that we aren't going to get any external supplies from some imaginary alien somewhere. We have pretty much are stuck with uh, what we've got here. Uh, so our biosphere, which is the area that we live in, because bios means life, our biosphere consists of three overlapping other spheres. We have the the atmosphere, which as you can guess is the, the air of the planet. We have the hydrosphere, which is the water that's available on planet Earth. And then we have the lithosphere, which is the rock or the solid crust of the Earth. Let's have a look at them one by one here, beginning with uh, the atmosphere. And if you look at the composition of our atmosphere, you can see that it's mostly made up of nitrogen. It's 78% nitrogen by volume. Nitrogen is a rather interesting molecule. Its formula is N2, and it's a gas. Uh, but its structure is rather interesting. The two nitrogen atoms are actually held together by three connecting covalent bonds. And what this means is that the N2 atom is extremely stable. Uh, we breathe it in, we breathe it out, it dissolves in our blood, but it's very, very inert. It doesn't react with anything or anybody because of those three bonds that hold it together so strongly. Uh, the one that we're probably most interested in is oxygen. Oxygen is about almost 21% of the atmosphere. Oxygen is O2, and it's a gas, and oxygen is held together by two covalent bonds. So it's not held together quite as strongly as nitrogen, and we use oxygen in a variety of chemical reactions. For example, whenever we're doing combustion, we also require oxygen for us to carry out the various reactions inside of our bodies. You can see that the remainder of the atmosphere is made up of small portions of all sorts of other gases mixed together and one of the gases we're going to be interested in later is carbon dioxide and you can see that it's a, it's a rather small percentage, 0.03 percent. Our atmosphere can be broken down into a series of levels. The one that we inhabit down here is called the troposphere. Uh, going from anywhere from sea level up to maybe uh, two kilometers in height. After that, uh, oxygen starts to be uh, less and less concentrated, and it gets rather difficult to, uh, to breathe. As we keep on moving up, we get into the stratosphere, and now we're talking about the area where some aircraft are capable of flying, so some commercial jets can get that high, certainly some military jets can get that high. Above that, we have the mesosphere, or the middle sphere, meso means middle, and be up above that one, we have the thermosphere. And lastly, we have way out in space, we have the exosphere. And this is where we're getting so far out that uh, you're probably not going to encounter hardly any molecules of oxygen out there at all. Some interesting things happen to the temperature. If you look at the scale at the bottom of this graph, uh, here is zero. There's the freezing point right there. And we see that down on the surface, the temperature can be rather comfortable for human beings. Uh, but as we go higher and higher in altitude, notice that the temperature drops. But uh, because of radiation coming in from outer space, we can get uh, areas, for example, here in the mesosphere, where that temperature uh, temporarily increases due to radiation, but then it drops again as we start running out of particles to transmit that heat with. Um, we have, for example, to give you comparisons, you can see where Mount Everest is in this one. It's uh, reaching up into the stratosphere. Very, very high. Only jets can get across that. We have places where you can get some very, very uh, thin clouds up high. And when you get up into the thermosphere and the exosphere, this is where you can see the, the northern lights or the southern lights, uh, depending on what hemisphere you live in. The lithosphere, as I said, is the solid portion of the Earth or the crust of the Earth. If we take a slice through the Earth and start in the middle, we have the core. And we can see that the core is broken down into an inner core, which is solid. And the core is composed mostly of iron and nickel. And this makes our Earth have a very, very strong magnetic field because it's composed of iron and nickel, which are both magnetic types of metals. The outer core surrounding it is, is liquid. We then have a layer called the mantle, and above the mantle we have a, a funny layer called the athenosphere, which is kind of like a soft plastic layer that allows the continents and the land masses up above to move past each other. So if we look at a diagram over here, we can see uh, about three different things that the crust of the planet can do. Uh, sometimes the 
plates uh, slip by each other. So these are the tectonic plates that make up the surface of the Earth. There's 13 major tectonic plates and a whole lot of little ones. Uh, sometimes plates slide uh, side by side each other. And a good example of this one is the San Andreas Fault down in California, where the, the plates are slipping laterally past each other. Uh, another thing that plates can do is they can pull apart. And this is what happens, for example, at places like uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where the uh, two plates are pulling apart. And this is caused by convection currents in the mantle, which are moving up, kind of like a boiling water in a kettle, moving in their circular convection pattern, pulling those plates apart. The other thing that can happen is we can have the plates colliding or crashing into each other. And if that's the case, one of them will go under. So here's a, an example here, say, on the Pacific coast of uh, Washington and Oregon, where we have, for example, the Pacific plate is uh, taking a nosedive underneath the, uh, the North American plate. This is called subduction. And what happens is as this plate descends, some hot magma comes up and you get volcanoes, things like uh, Mount St. Helens, Mount Rainier, things like that. And so we, we live on a lithosphere that because it has quite a lot of heat being generated by the core and because these places like the, uh, the outer core and the mantle and the athenosphere are, are liquid, we can get a tremendous amount of movement up on the surface here. Having a look at the uh, hydrosphere is rather interesting. If, if we look at this pie series of pie graphs here and if we take all of the water on the planet you can see that 97% of the water on Earth is saline or salty. In other words, you, you can't drink it. This is what we have in our oceans. And that, in fact, on planet Earth, only 3% of all the water that's on this planet is freshwater or drinkable. If we take that sliver of freshwater and break it down, you can see that most of it is frozen in ice caps and glaciers, which means we're not going to be, get much use out of that water. About 30% of it is groundwater, which means it's located under the ground. I suppose you could drill a well and get it. And then of the surface water, which is not very much, 0.30%, if we take that and break it down, we see that 87% of the fresh water on Earth is uh, found in lakes, 11% is found in swamps, 2% found in rivers. But all of that fresh water uh, is a very, very, again, look back here, a very, very small sliver of all of the water that's on the planet. Makes you kind of think and wonder that, uh, geez, maybe we should better take uh, good care of our fresh water because we, we sure don't have a tremendous amount of it, do we? Lastly, there's a connection on our Earth between your altitude and the temperature. So, for example, we know that if you're on Earth and you start here at the equator and you move towards the pole, either the North Pole or the South Pole, we know that you go through various tropical zones. We start at the tropics, we go to temperate forests, coniferous forests, uh, we have grasslands and tundra. And finally, we get polar Arctic regions. And that's what happens as you go from the warm equator to the colder poles. But something very, very similar happens as you go vertically, as you go up through our atmosphere, it, it gets colder. So if we were looking at, for example, a mountain in Africa like Mount Kilimanjaro, and if you start off at the bottom, you would have indeed tropical vegetation. But as you move up higher on the mountain, you start seeing temperate trees, coniferous trees. You start getting it looking like a sort of a tundra up at the top here. And the very, very top is even snow capped, uh, even in the summertime. So there's a definite connection between your altitude uh, and your temperature that kind of corresponds with your latitude. Something else interesting that can happen in the atmosphere is if we look at a situation here of, say, this city, uh, typically what happens, of course, is, you know, warm air rises because it's less dense. The particles are further apart, and so they rise up. And so what tends to happen as we go up, we have warm, and then it gets cool, and then it gets even cooler as you go higher and higher. But sometimes, due to conditions like this city here, kind of being trapped between these, these two sort of uh, mountain regions, what can sometimes happen is that uh, due to pollution, we can get an entrapment of, of these, this pollution here, which causes what's called an inversion. In other words, it's almost like putting a lid on top of the whole system. And so what happens is you get a, a sort of an upside down effect here where it's cooler down here and warmer up there. If you measure this on a graph, you'll see your graph suddenly change here, a bit of a zigzag. And you can sometimes see this, for example, in large cities. You can see these inversions, especially on a day of heavy pollution and when wind conditions are just right. You'll sort of see it as a haze that spreads all over the, the upper portions of the city, covering the whole thing. It kind of makes you wonder what we're breathing, doesn't it?